Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. Andrew is away tonight on the first anniversary of Canada's first case of COVID, the failures and the challenges. It's either pay my full rent and not eat, or eat and get behind in my rent. Taking the measure of the disproportionate impact. COVID hits and the world stops. Plus, where we go from here on vaccines and new variants. Also tonight. Each day literally means lives. The new urgency for vaccinations in long-term care homes. And the BC couple under suspicion and ticketed. They put a community at risk for their own benefit, and, and that to me is appalling. The allegation, a 2,800-kilometer trip and a ruse to jump the vaccine queue. This is The National. Well, what a year it's been. When the very first Canadian case of the novel coronavirus was announced, it was indeed novel. And the future, just how much was about to change, was very much unknown. Well, since then, three quarters of a million Canadians have caught the virus. Nearly 20,000 have died. Hospitals have faced incredible pressures and waves of lockdowns have put people out of work and exposed inequities. Well, now we face new worries about vaccine supply and new variants of the virus. And while this has been a long, long year for everyone, it is also clear that some groups have suffered more than others, like those who live and work in long-term care homes. In those settings, COVID is an especially brutal killer with vaccines seen as a lifeline in province after province. But some say Ontario has not been fast enough. David Common looks at its new plan to change that. Across Canada, getting vaccines into the arms of those in long-term care was always a priority, just more so in some provinces than others. PEI has effectively finished its first round, as has Alberta, with BC and Quebec closing the gap. The reason for the speed is simple. Once infected, care home residents are the group most likely to die. But Ontario, where 40% of homes are now in outbreak, worse than anywhere else in Canada, first wave and now, it's struggling. So the province is switching gears. We're accelerating vaccinations from our most vulnerable seniors with new supplies temporarily halted, Ontario is using the shots it has to immunize all care home residents by February 5th, moving plans up by 10 days. Each day literally means lives. You know, am I incredibly frustrated with the rollout overall and, and the very slow pace and the incompleteness of vaccinating long-term care residents? Absolutely. Ontario has given 292,000 shots, more than enough for the province's 72,000 residents in long-term care. But only about 46,000 of them have been vaccinated. Now they become the priority, and this document released last week may be a factor why. It calculated how many more lives could have been saved if Ontario had moved up its initial vaccination deadline for care home residents to January 21st or January 31st. I think it would have made a significant difference uh, with many of the residents. Brian Graham's mom, Bernice, died last week after the COVID variant swept through Roberta Place long-term care. The shot came too late for many. A third of the residents are now dead, virtually all of them infected, leaving this doctor working inside stunned. And the sense of loss every day is just really extraordinary. I mean, the staff don't have time to grieve. It's so hard. And, and why is it, David, that some provinces are, are so much further ahead than others? Yeah, Adrian, it's partly size and population. PEI is small compared to Ontario, which is huge, much more logistically complex, but also comes down to choices. So, you know, those uh, Pfizer vaccines had to go in those ultra cold fridges. Quebec bought them, put them in their long term care homes and vaccinated people right there. Ontario bought them, put them in hospitals. And because of that, it was a little harder to get them into long-term care homes. You'll also remember that Pfizer changed its advice back on December 18th, said they don't have to be in those ultra-cold freezers. You can take them out, take them out for about five days. And Quebec adapted really quickly. Ontario, though, was a bit slower. That's kind of how we are where we are. All right, David Common in Toronto. Thank you, David. Now, David mentioned that deadly outbreak at Roberta Place Long-Term Care in Barrie, Ontario. In our coverage last night, we incorrectly showed some images 
of the Roberta Place Retirement Lodge. We want to clarify that is a separate building. It does not have a COVID-19 outbreak. Now tomorrow, MPs are set to hold an emergency debate about the supply of COVID-19 vaccines. This is the week Canada gets hit hardest by a sharp cut in shipments of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. As Pfizer is in the midst of retooling a plant in Belgium, there are no deliveries to Canada this week. And over a four-week period that started last week, Canada will get about 400,000 fewer doses than expected. Now, opposition parties pushed for tomorrow's debate and gave us a taste today of how they're framing this as a failure of the government. Catherine Cullen looks into that. Safe, effective vaccines are being administered across Canada. Being administered, yes. Delivering new doses, no. This week, Canada will receive zero vaccines. Some Pfizer vaccines will be delivered next week, but just a fraction of what was planned. Canada's other approved vaccine, Moderna, is only delivered every three weeks. This isn't one of them. How the hell did this happen, and what are the Liberals doing to fix it? We are on track with our strategy. This is a temporary interruption. Global vaccine trackers now rank Canada 18th in terms of per capita vaccinations. We know that momentary delays are happening on Pfizer, but we will be receiving hundreds of thousands of doses uh, later in February. The federal government says everything will be back on track by the end of March with enough vaccines for 3 million Canadians. The longer things get delayed for places like long-term care, the, the more deaths that may mount that are potentially preventable. The Conservatives want to know why Canada can't get vaccines from Pfizer's U.S. facility. Did the Prime Minister ask for the ability to have that plant used, not just rely on the retooled plant in Belgium. The Prime Minister and President Biden did recently talk vaccine collaboration, but Biden has big plans for his country. I feel confident that uh, by summer we're going to be well on our way to heading toward herd immunity. And Pfizer says vaccines made in the U.S. are for Americans. Europe sounds increasingly protectionist. The European Union will take any action required to protect its citizens and rights. Leaving concerns that Canada could be hit again by future disruptions. We're a small fish in the pond and, you know, I, uh, we don't manufacture this drug on site. So he says we need to use what we do have to save as many lives as possible. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. Moderna says its COVID-19 vaccine works against new, more infectious variants of the virus. The company says its vaccine is effective against the variants first identified in Britain and South Africa, but might be slightly less protective against the strain discovered in South Africa. Moderna is exploring a booster shot targeting that strain. A BC couple is alleged to be at the center of a sophisticated scheme to jump the vaccine queue by traveling to a tiny town in Yukon. They are accused of chartering flights and breaking quarantines before being caught and ticketed. Tanya Fletcher looks at the couple, their trip, and the growing outrage. I think it's a good example of um, privilege. It's seems a bit slippery. I think it's kind of sad. This is the couple at the centre of it all. Rodney Baker, now former CEO of the great Canadian gaming corporation, and Ekaterina Baker, a Russian-born actress. It's believed the pair flew from Vancouver to Whitehorse on January 19th. Two days later, skipping the mandatory 14-day quarantine, the Bakers chartered a flight nearly 500 kilometres away to Beaver Creek, Canada's westernmost community near the Alaska border. That's where they allegedly lined up outside one of these mobile vaccines vaccination clinics posing as workers of the local motel. Staff who actually work at the motel are incensed. We live in a community of 80 people. We know who's in our town. They put us all at risk. They thought they had enough money to be able to buy the system. That's the scary part. But the biggest red flag came after the two were immunized. But then as they were leaving, they said, could they get a lift to the airport? Of course, the vaccine clinic folks said no because they're working to vaccinate people. That's not what they're going to be doing. And, but that sounded very strange to the teams. And after that, officials were tipped off. They went to the airport and found this, this couple uh, boarding a flight to leave the Yukon to, to head back wherever. 
and, and that's when they got charged. Copies of the tickets show they were charged with two counts each of failing to self-isolate and failing to follow a declaration. Each charge comes with a fine of up to $500 or six months in jail or both. CBC News has reached out to the couple for comment. We haven't heard back. I think they should be ashamed of themselves. Um, they put a community at risk for their own benefit and, and that to me is appalling. BC Health officials voicing the frustration felt by many, many who are still patiently waiting their turn to get the vaccine. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver. Starting tomorrow, travelers flying to the United States will need to present a negative coronavirus test before boarding their flights. The requirement will apply to all passengers aged two and up. Washington also added non-Americans traveling from South Africa to lists of those currently banned from entering the U.S. Since Canada made pre-flight COVID tests mandatory for air passengers flying here, Transport Canada says at least 50,000 reservations have just been cancelled. Now Ottawa is considering more restrictions. Allison Northcott has the details. The possibility of more travel restrictions has some worried about what could soon be off limits. It's important to reduce the travels, but uh, not all because it's necessary to see a family once in a while. People coming into Canada have to isolate for 14 days and those flying in over the age of five need proof of a negative COVID test. But there are calls for the federal government to do more. I see these planes flying in one after the other after the other. And every time I look up in the sky, I'm thinking how, how many cases are coming in? This, this has to stop. Now is not the time to travel. Ottawa is weighing its options. Our government absolutely is looking seriously and carefully at measures to further guarantee uh, the toughness of our border measures. Quebec Premier Francois Legault has floated the idea of mandatory hotel quarantines at the traveler's expense after non-essential trips abroad, similar to New Zealand. This looming 14-day quarantine in a hotel is, the, I think, the only thing that's going to restrict people from traveling completely. It may be too late to prevent the importation of those particular variants. This researcher has studied the effectiveness of travel restrictions when it comes to controlling the virus. It could still continue to reduce the number of those cases coming in. Plus, as we're learning, there are new variants of this emerging all the time, and so it could be uh, useful in preventing them. But there may be limits in how far the government can go, since it's a charter right for Canadians to enter or leave the country. You would have to show that everything else has failed, and you have to show that with you know graphs and, and facts and figures. Airlines say they're already feeling the strain and want the government to consult with them. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. One case of the UK variant is raising some alarm in Alberta tonight, as officials fear it may have entered the community. These new variants present a, a serious threat and a complicating factor when it comes to relaxing restrictions. As of today, the province has identified 20 cases of the variant first found in the UK and five of the one first found in South Africa. All but one have been linked to international travel, raising concerns that Alberta may have more cases. Provinces have never fully harnessed the 15 million rapid tests distributed across the country. Even though they are less accurate than lab tests, they yield faster results and can be a powerful tool to limit outbreaks. Nicole Ireland shows us how they might be used better. Within two hours, you are going to get a text message if it's negative. This is a pop-up testing center at Dalhousie University in Halifax. The federal government has sent more than 15 million rapid COVID tests across the country. Nova Scotia's top doctor says using them has helped it stay a few steps ahead of the virus. That rapid surge in testing allowed us to, I think really was a key part of, along with tight restrictions, allowed us to get a hold of, of this. That's because the rapid testers encourage everyone to get a test, even if they don't have symptoms. And if you wait for people to come and, and develop symptoms, you're going to miss a lot of people. In some hard-hit provinces, like Ontario, getting the traditional PCR test often requires symptoms and a long wait for the results. Although it's the gold standard, many doctors say all the provinces should make more use of the rapid tests as a first line of defense. 
while a rapid antigen test is not as accurate as the laboratory-based PCR test, uh, a rapid antigen test is certainly better than no test at all. That way, people who test positive can be quickly isolated to stop the spread, then get the PCR test to double check. Although Nova Scotia is ramping up, it's used just 15,000 of its 300,000 rapid tests. Alberta has one and a half million, but has only deployed 12,000. They're using them in places like hospitals and homeless shelters, but only on people who already have COVID symptoms. So far, Ontario has used less than a quarter of its four and a half million tests. It's deploying them to remote communities, First Nations, long-term care homes, and workplaces. Many experts say schools are another place where rapid tests should be used. Next week, Quebec is starting a pilot project to see how well that works. Nicole Ireland, CBC News, Toronto. The Liberal Party has removed an Ontario MP from its federal caucus. In a statement, the party says Ramesh Sangha is accused of making baseless and dangerous allegations against a number of colleagues, but no further details were given. CBC News has reached out to Sangha's office, has not received a response. The Brampton Centre MP will now sit as an independent. And controversial Ontario Senator Lynn Bayak is stepping down three years before her mandatory retirement. She was suspended twice from the Red Chamber for questionable comments about the Indigenous residential school system and for hosting racist posts on her website. In her resignation letter today, Bayak says she stands by her views. Turning to Washington now, U.S. President Joe Biden is moving forward with another of his campaign pledges. And like the cancelling of the Keystone XL pipeline last week, this one could also affect Canada. Katie Simpson explains why it's not yet clear what new Buy American rules mean for Canadian companies. Ensuring the future is made in America by American, all American workers. With this signature, another unknown is thrust upon the Canada-U.S. relationship. The president's Buy American plan aims to make it easier for American companies to land lucrative contracts, selling goods and services to the U.S. government while freezing out foreign competitors. I'm taking the first steps in my larger Build Back Better recovery plan that invests in American workers, unions and businesses up and down the supply chain. The plan will try to boost the U.S. manufacturing sector with the creation of stricter rules requiring products be made in America. Small and medium-sized American businesses will be encouraged to bid on government contracts, while foreign companies will have to get explicit permission from the White House before securing a deal. When it comes to Buy America and protectionism from the U.S. overall, it is not a new thing for our government. Uh, it is something we know how to deal with, we know how to push back on. The Trudeau government plans to lobby the Biden administration against changes that could hurt Canadian industries. Possible targets include steel manufacturers producing materials for U.S. infrastructure projects and Canadian auto plants filling fleet vehicle orders for federal agencies. Automotive products go back and forth across the border seven or eight times before they end up on a vehicle. So what is American and what is Canadian? The head of the Auto Parts Manufacturing Association says right now he's not too worried about these new measures because of the deep integration in the Canada-U.S. supply chain. We've grown up together, we've industrialized together, we really work together. So Katie, in the end, what does this mean for the relationship between the Biden administration and the Trudeau government? We'll have to wait and see if this Buy American plan becomes a new irritant. The U.S. government spends about $600 billion every year on these contracts. Canadian companies account for a tiny amount, about $600 million of it. But it's also important to remember this announcement comes just days after the Biden administration killed the Keystone XL pipeline. Source tells me there's still a lot of enthusiasm and optimism about working with the Biden team, and these early setbacks and potential setbacks will not define the relationship. Adrian. All right, Katie Simpson, thank you. Thanks. When it comes to less friendly relationships, Joe Biden has promised a foreign policy reset and a return to more traditional diplomacy, hoping to dial down the temperature when it comes to dealing with foes like Iran. Key to that his goal to return to the 2015 Iran nuclear deal. But as Margaret Evans explains, political changes in the region could get in his way. 
Few in Iran are shedding tears over the departure of the now ex-U.S. President Donald J. Trump, leaving behind, at least for some, hope. At least we're facing a new U.S. president we think we can deal with, says this young man. But key to that for both countries will be the thorniest of issues, a potential return to the 2015 nuclear deal negotiated by six world powers, including the Obama administration, and tossed aside by Trump. The United States will withdraw from the Iran nuclear deal. Since then, Iran has increased its uranium stockpiles eightfold, according to watchdogs. Analysts say it could be an attempt at leverage. If there is enough political will, technically most of these actions are reversible. Joe Biden's press secretary, first day on the job, said he's willing to lengthen and strengthen the nuclear deal. Iran must resume compliance with significant nuclear constraints under the deal uh, in order for that to proceed. Iran's president, Hassan Rouhani, has said if the U.S. rejoins and lifts sanctions, then Iran will also comply with its obligations. But only, say experts in Tehran, if there are no strings attached. They didn't appease Trump, and the Biden administration shouldn't expect them to appease Biden. But the political landscape has shifted since 2015. There's likely to be more pressure on Biden from Israel, for example, now closer to Gulf states, also eager to curb Iran's influence. And another shift is on the way in Iran itself. Presidential elections in June. And Rouhani, who staked his reputation on the nuclear deal, won't be running. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. The trial of Joe Biden's predecessor moved a step closer tonight in the U.S. Senate. Ready to present the article of impeachment, which has been preferred by the House of Representatives against Donald John Trump. So that article charges Trump with inciting insurrection in the January 6th siege at the Capitol that left five people dead. Tonight, CNN reported that Biden doesn't believe there will be the 67 votes needed to convict. Arguments are set to begin the week of February the 8th. Tonight, a glimpse inside Canadian hospitals after a year of COVID-19. Every ICU is short-staffed at the moment. Ahead on the national, healthcare workers share their stories. And Canadians reflect on a year few could have imagined. COVID hits and the world stops, literally. Plus, the pandemic's unprecedented and unequal toll on the economy. I can feel my blood beginning to surge and anxiety and fear. And he shoots, he scores, and he inspires. I've been playing hockey since I was four years old, and I love taking slap shots. The Backyard Hockey Fino. We are back in two. Let's turn our strength into hope. Well, for the first time in nearly 40 years, Budweiser will not be running an ad at this year's Super Bowl. Instead, the brand posted this ad online announcing donations towards COVID vaccine aware awareness. Anheuser-Busch, which owns the brand, will have commercials for some of its other products at the big game. That's a strategy employed by other major companies, including PepsiCo. So this is all just another sign of the enormous impact COVID and COVID restrictions have had throughout the economy. As Canada marks one year since its first COVID case and the recovery remains in the future, Peter Armstrong looks at how some people have been hit so much harder than others. Every downturn is unfair, but the COVID catastrophe is uniquely unequal. This deepest recession in modern memory has devastated the economy but it saved its worst for the most vulnerable workers. I can feel my blood beginning to surge and anxiety and fear. Janaba Dale was a server working events in Toronto when the pandemic hit. She was making $12 an hour. It was never enough, but when the events shut down, her worries compounded quickly. It's either pay my full rent and not eat, or eat and get behind in my rent. Serb and now EI have helped. Dale is upgrading her serving skills by taking wine courses online. Meantime, she's running up debt. It's a lot of 
okay, I'm going to pay the minimum on this credit card and then use that to buy food because there's a 20 extra dollars on there that's not in my bank account so I can get my groceries done. You can see Dale's story in every chart and every graph chronicling the painful collapse in the face of COVID. GDP, jobs numbers, hours worked, they all tell the same devastating story. But while millions of Canadians suffered, millions more simply began working from home. They didn't pay for childcare, pay for parking or travel, and they saved money through the crisis. The sale of cottages and country homes skyrocketed. Buying rural real estate where you can escape to, where you can find some peace and quiet. Initially, real estate agents were just as worried as everyone else, but it quickly became clear they'd need to hustle just to keep up as white collar employees working remotely looked for a break from quarantine. You know, feeling so cooped up inside for such a long period of time. Economists call this a K-shaped recovery, where one branch thrives and moves up while another falls. The concern is how far that lower branch goes down. Some of these effects could end up being permanent. In other words, the bottom part of the K could persist uh, quite a while. Dale says she wouldn't have been able to survive without government support. She says the pandemic should make everyone rethink how we as a society support vulnerable workers. Changes to how we approach people who are renters. Changes to how we support folks who, again, are down on their luck. The recovery is coming. But for lower income Canadians worst hit by this crisis, simply getting back to normal won't be good enough. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. Next, reflections on the year that changed everything. COVID hits and the world stops, literally. Four Canadians share their stories and the hard lessons learned since Canada's first confirmed case of COVID-19. And later, a centuries-old innovation making a pandemic comeback. Many people today are noting an anniversary we'd like to forget. A year ago, we announced the first confirmed case of COVID-19 in Toronto. The case is in a male who's in his 50s. Um, he had traveled to Wuhan, China, and uh, come back and within, uh, within a day became quite ill. There's a very good chance you now have a jarring feeling after watching that clip. Seeing people sit that close together inside without masks, that jarring feeling is just one of the ways this last year has changed us, how we live, how we work, in some cases, who we are. And so to mark this day, we asked some people to take a look back at their experiences of the last year and their takeaways. Nick Purden brings us their story. Have you had the new brownie? I've had it. It's oh, ridiculous. The dive for. Man, they are so good. And the icing is What you're like seeing here, here, Jen Kukic in front of her bakery hanging out with her customers, this didn't really happen before the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, I'll try a cheese biscuit. I don't think I've had it. You've never had a cheese biscuit. No, right? Like, <laughs> we get Chelsea a cheese biscuit, Jen! <laughs> Jen's bakery is dairy free and gluten free. It's a lifeline for people who have digestive problems. Before the pandemic, Jen sold hundreds of loaves of bread a day. Then came COVID. We shut down for six weeks, and they were the longest six weeks of my life. Thank you. I won't lie, I've had, you know, an hour cry sitting in the middle of my shower, not knowing what to do, and the pressure of staff not being together or paid or customers not getting bread. And I knew that I wasn't alone, that I was the same as them. No, you go ahead. Thank you. The pandemic helped Jen realize just how connected she was to her customers. So even though the bakery was closed, she and her husband went to work. We would come in here and we would bake uh, hundreds of loaves of bread and we literally drop them off at people's houses. We'd leave the bag at the front door and then we'd get back in the car and then we'd call real quick and say, just let you know your bread's outside. They drove hundreds of kilometers to deliver the loaves free of charge. The result of that? How come you're skipping school? <laughs> That's what you see outside the bakery today. You wanted cinnamon buns, right? Yeah, exactly. Ann Potter says the bread Jen delivered made a huge difference during the lockdown. I now think of Jen more as a friend and a family member than just a place I come to shop. <laughs> just frankly that she cared enough to provide that to some of us. It just, it gets you right in the feels. <laughs> 
All right, go get some cinnamon buns, boys. Okay. Oh, we're <laughs> I think I love my customers a little bit more now. <laughs> Oh, it smells so Have good. a good week. That's how the pandemic has changed things here at this bakery. And the reality is everybody, no matter who you are, has gone through something in the year of COVID. COVID hits and the world stops, literally. School stopped. We got an email from U of T, all of us like, it was almost like a movie scene. You know, everyone looks at their phone at once. Um, and we saw that they were shutting down campus as of that day. And now almost a year later, Corel Peters is finishing up her degree on Zoom. I didn't picture it this way. You know, my parents are immigrants and I'm the first in my family to pursue a university education. And so I was really looking forward to a lot of the milestones that come along with that. You know, convocation and getting that diploma and my parents being there. Corel's parents came to Canada from Jamaica. Her dad was an electrician. Her mom worked at the local grocery store. I feel a lot of guilt when I think about the fact that I'm sad over not getting to have a convocation when there's people dying every day, when we're in the middle of a global pandemic. But convocation for me isn't small because it's, it's not just for me, it's for my family. It means everything they went through, everything they did to get me to this moment was worth it. It's often like that. When something is taken away, we learn just how much it means. And the pandemic has done that for all of us. For family doctor Javid Alou, the pandemic has meant completely rethinking his practice. A year ago, when COVID first came to Canada, I was terrified. I was worried that people were gonna die. I'm still worried that people are gonna die in preventable ways. Dr. Alou faces that reality every day. His clinic is in a neighborhood with one of the highest COVID counts in the country. In many ways, I think the pandemic has been a truth serum. It's actually uncovered the truths and faults and gaps in our healthcare system. And we've had the chance now to try to address those challenges because we can't ignore them anymore. I, I think... Um... One of the gaps Dr. Alou worries about is with the focus on COVID, people with other illnesses will fall through the cracks. Yeah. Uh, what parts would you not want to lose? He fundamentally changed his practice to prevent that. So one of the things I can do now is actually involve more people in a visit than I could before. I could include not just the patient themselves, but their daughter who lives in a different city, their pharmacist, their social worker who comes to see them once in a while, and we could all talk together about what needs to be done for care. Uh, and that's an amazing strength that I wouldn't want to lose after the pandemic. Are you saying that in some ways the care that you provide has gotten better? I think for my most vulnerable patients, my care has gotten a lot stronger and better because we're working together as a team, as a community, to support patients who need it most. Something we've all learned in the year of COVID is that people living in precarious conditions become even more vulnerable during a pandemic. You gotta keep the park clean, you know? I meet Domenico Saxida in a park in downtown Toronto. How's it going? He's 56, and COVID has been hard on him. A lot of heartache. I lost my father to it six months ago. My dad got COVID from the retirement home that my sisters put him in. He was 84, I believe. I guess his immune system was really weak. He just finished battling cancer. He didn't deserve to die like that, alone. Every day's a battle. Domenico couldn't help his dad, but ever since he moved into the park a year or so ago, he's tried to help others. Even this tent, I just put this tent up today for a guy that came in yesterday. I decided to do something positive and build something that I can help other people while I'm out here. Because the way all the, a lot of people have, that have helped me since I've been out here, when I had nothing, nothing, just a suitcase with a couple of pairs of clothes in it. Now, you know, I got a, that's, that's a home. That's generally a home. It's all completely sealed in, insulated. In the last year, Domenico has seen more and more people move onto the streets, as some of Toronto's shelters have had COVID outbreaks. It's a home away from home. Even so, he tells me there's an upside to the crisis. The only positive thing that's come out of this is that the public knows what's going on out here, and the government can't hide it anymore. People have been coming out in droves. Even people out of town have been coming to this park to bring clothing, supplies, et cetera, anything and everything that we need. The government's reluctancy to build affordable housing, this is the result. And the pandemic has brought it to light. 
since the pandemic began about a year ago. We've all adapted and changed to some degree. And when it's over, maybe some of those changes will be worth keeping. Nick Purden, CBC News, Toronto. We love you Next, the reality inside Canadian hospitals after a year of COVID. Every ICU is short-staffed at the moment. Healthcare workers share what this all looks and feels like from their perspective right after the break. Welcome back. Nearly one year into the pandemic and pretty much everyone is feeling the strain, none more so than healthcare workers in COVID wards. Two Toronto hospitals shared footage from inside showing what it's like on the front lines. Christine Birak takes us through the painful stories revealed. <laughs> One of the things that the public should know is at a time when everybody else is running away from this, uh, healthcare workers are running towards it to fight it. And I do call it a war. You still have two lungs on the board for tomorrow as well. A registered nurse for over 30 years, Denise Morris leads one of the three intensive care units here inside Toronto General Hospital. It's 7.30 in the morning and her 12-hour shift is ending. Any issues? No, we're good. We're extubated. We did unfortunately have a death uh, and that's always hard uh, on, on the team. The last face some patients see isn't a family member. It's their doctor, nurse or a spiritual care fellow. Yeah, for sure. That, this for me has been the... You're a surrogate family. Every everyone is surrogate family. Yeah, that's the family. The patient did have a family member nearby, but now others have arrived. There are three for the family. Yeah. yeah. And then they're all three of the two it's, going. Yeah, I feel like patients are sicker. Yeah, and it, I don't feel like we're saving as many. Yeah. Many lives are being saved, but every life lost leaves its mark. Unfortunately, and I think that takes a toll on everyone's soul. As Morris ends her day, respiratory therapist Ruan Sale is starting hers. There's multiple steps in order to protect yourself, and if you miss a step or you touch your face before you wash your hands, there's that risk or that fear of um, getting COVID. Our hands are dry. My hands hurt every single day I'm at work. It's just, it's nonstop. It's just you're going from room to room to room and doing the same process every single room. Sale is now accustomed to systematically putting on and taking off personal protective equipment. That fear has largely been replaced by the strain of treating a tide of patients. No hospital understands the strain of this pandemic better than Sunnybrook Health Sciences. One year ago, workers here cared for Canada's first patient. So, this is the COVID unit. Majority of the nurses are already in their rooms caring for their patients. So today we are up to 15 ventilated patients. Victoria Boateng is a critical care nurse. Every ICU is short-staffed at the moment. Um, and we have multiple patients that are sitting in emergency as well as on other units. Who are Boateng is part of a rapid response team. As ICUs fill up, patients in need of life-saving care are ending up in other parts of the hospital. Um, and I don't think the public always understands that. Um, it's like the proverb, it takes a village to take care of a child and it sort of feels like us as the healthcare providers um, are the village that's taking care of everyone's loved one. How are you? Good, how are you? And that village is exhausted. 
it's really concerning about the rate of burnout that is going around right now with healthcare providers. Um, we're really hoping that we can um, get through this and come out on top. But it is like in war, most people never see the front line where battles are being won and lost every day. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. So a big thank you to all of the healthcare workers there. We didn't send our own cameras inside. Those videos were sent in by the staff at the hospitals. We all appreciate their unique view of life on the front line. All right, next on the national, a little old school Italian creativity in the face of adversity. The return of the wine window right after the break. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, thousands have been detained following mass protests in support of Vladimir Putin's best-known critic, Alexei Navalny. What's next for the movement? Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Well, the pandemic has forced restaurants everywhere to rethink how they interact with customers. In Florence, Italy, the city has tapped into an old curiosity of its architecture and revived tiny windows of opportunity. Megan Williams shows us. Florence, Italy, the jewel of the Renaissance, from the Ponte Vecchio to the towering Duomo, a city for centuries largely unaltered, including the survival and now revival of small openings on walls throughout Florence, called Buchette del Vino, or wine windows where restaurants and bars pass a glass of Chianti through a thick stone wall to be enjoyed on the street. <laughs> Matteo Faglia is an amateur historian who's been promoting the reopening of wine windows here. Like this one, they date back more than 500 years, when noble Florentine families began to sell their wine directly through the Buchette. Several hundred remain today, some with opening hours still posted. Others converted to doorbells, all with their unmistakable dome shape. Just enough space to pass a fiasco of wine through, still visible. Today's COVID pandemic takes us back in time to the Black Plague of 1630, says Faglio, when Buchette took on an essential role to sell and buy wine without passing on the plague. During the Black Plague, Le Bouquette, or wine windows, were no longer used just to sell wine, but also for social distancing. And now, some 400 years later, with the coronavirus pandemic, the little windows are once again opening up throughout Florence. This restaurant owner says opening its wine window has injected some joy into the city. Revitalizing something that people, that were something on the past and we use it from, for another way. So also in the night is a nice thing to do. It's an attraction, so it's great too. I think uh, that the COVID is going to disappear very soon, eh? I hope. Eh? And uh, nonetheless, uh, I mean, uh, this, this Buchette will remain uh, despite, uh, the, despite the, 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 the COVID. Something worth drinking to. Megan Williams, CBC News, Florence. Indeed. Next on The National, a nine-year-old hockey prodigy who is more than comfortable on the ice. His serious moves, next in our moment. Nine-year-old Washie Jeanette loves to play hockey. He spends hours on his backyard rink. Clearly, he's pretty good at it. So he has some serious skills and some pretty fancy moves, and tonight... He's our moment. We decided to build an outdoor rink so to pass the time during the pandemic. I've been playing hockey since I was four years old and I love taking slap shots. For him to go outside and practice the, the sport he loves, it's been great. Every day after school, they've been doing videos and practicing hockey since they had no access to the arenas or the local rink. Barbara, I challenge you to the most spin challenge. The move is it's called the Michigan. It was originated from um, Mike Legg, which uh, he performed it in a game. 
it's been improved since then. So kids want to try it, and I think uh, this little guy has perfected it uh, for quite a bit now. During these COVID times, do everything you can to keep your chums and cook them safe. Miigwech. Okay, he's really good. So uh, our producer Eliza says that uh, Washie is a little bit shy, but something happens when he gets on the ice. Uh, it clearly lifts him. We appreciate that. That is a national for January the 25th.